Welcome to this presentation, which will cover chapter 21 of our textbook. Uh, the name of this chapter is Forms of Business Organization. Um, <clears throat> this is a very, very complex subject. Um, in our paralegal program, we have a, an entire course just on this particular topic. Um, in law school, um, also, as students routinely take at least one sem one semester course and many times two semester courses in this topic. Um, this is probably the most practical. There's an arg arguable, arguably another cha uh, uh, chapter that is also very very practical, and that would be um, the employment uh, law chapter. But uh, this chapter, along with the employment law chapter, are probably the two most practical chapters that we cover. That's especially true if you have an entrepreneurial um, uh, spirit and are planning on at some point starting your own business. Because under those circumstances, you'll need to decide how to structure your business, both at the beginning stages and as you grow the business and as your success continues to increase. Um, for the most part, entrepreneurs usually make business organization choices, at least in the beginning, on their own. There usually isn't the need to hire a CPA or a, a, an attorney during the early stages. Obviously, if your business becomes fabulously successful, at some point you'll be hiring accountants and attorneys. But many of these decisions you can make independently, and so uh, you may want to file away this information so that when you are ready to use it, you'll have it available. Um, let's get started. We're going to discuss six types of business organizations in this lecture. Actually, we're going to discuss more than six, but there's six that we're going to spend a pretty significant amount of time on. There's probably about another six or so that we'll touch on very, very briefly. Um, and they, these, the six are, as I said here, sole proprietorship. Then we have three types of partnership that we'll talk about. So we're kind of grouping these three together. Then we'll talk about limited liability companies, and also we'll talk about a corporation. We'll actually talk about two types of corporation here. So let's get started. We're going to focus on that first one, that sole proprietorship. And it makes sense that we talk about sole proprietorship first because it's the simplest of our six entities that we'll be talking about. It is the default setting. If you decide to start a business and you don't do anything to create a business organization structure, this is what you will have automatically. It's the default setting for our system. So what is a sole proprietorship? Well, we see two words in it, and the two words are pretty good indications about what's going on. The word sole, as we know, means one or only. So this type of business structure applies when there is a single owner. So we're not talking about a situation with two or more owners. There's a different term for that, partnership. So in this situation, there is a single owner. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't employees in the business. There can be lots of employees. In theory, you could have hundreds or thousands of employees in the sole proprietorship. Those employees don't own the business, they just work for the business. As a practical matter though, most sole proprietorships have only one or two or three or you know maybe as many as 10 employees but usually not very many because once the business grows to a certain point um, it doesn't really make sense to continue as a sole proprietorship I mean to continue the business certainly yes but not to continue it in this particular mode so we've talked about how there is a single owner but there's lots of business structures that allow for there to be a single owner that's not especially distinctive with respect to a sole proprietorship. Um, what's distinctive about it is that the single owner has um, uh, complete control over the management and profits, but that makes sense given the fact that he or she is a sole proprietor, is the only person who owns the business. But the aspects that make it distinctive from other uh, formats are that the owner has unlimited personal liability. Let's pause for a moment and talk about kind of the two buckets of liability that we have with businesses, typically. One is the investment that the owner makes in the business. So let's say that I am a fabulously wealthy person. I, am, uh, I have $10 million sitting in my checking account waiting to invest. I won the lottery or maybe I was fabulously successful. Maybe I inherited him. And who knows how I got my $10 million, but I have it sitting in the bank account. 
and I decide I want to start a business. But the business I want to start is a pretty simple business. It's a taco stand. And I start it with just taking out a hundred thousand dollars. I mean I probably don't even need a hundred thousand dollars, but I want to do it right. So I take one hundred thousand dollars out of my ten million dollar bank account. So now I have nine million nine hundred thousand dollars in my bank account and I have this one hundred thousand dollars that I'm investing in the business. Well, it ends up that while I was uh, smart enough to, to get $10 million to begin with, I happened to be a really, really bad taco uh, restaurant owner. I mean, I, my tacos are awful. Uh, customers never come back. Um, all the reviews are bad. After a while, nobody is coming to my taco shop. And I eventually decide to cut my losses and to close it. Well, under that situation, I, I, there are kind of two ways that, that we can see the liability. The first is that um, I have the business liability, the amount that I have chosen to invest, my $100,000. That I can completely lose no matter what type of business structure I have. So any of these business structures, I would lose my investment, my $100,000. That's a given. I, that I could lose it. I mean, it's not a given. I will lose it because hopefully my business is successful. But when it completely flops, then that is absolutely always in danger. But then I have my other money, my nine million nine hundred thousand. What's left over for my ten million after I've made my investment? Some business entities that I have this money will be safe. Sometimes it will be in jeopardy. Let me give you an example of what might happen. I said I was a really bad taco maker, but I'm not just really bad at making tacos. I'm also a health hazard to the larger community. I mean, I don't have good hygienic practices. I don't cook the meat enough. I don't refrigerate it before I cook it enough. And honestly, several of my customers have gotten very, very sick. They've gotten E. coli, they've had to be hospitalized, they have permanent health issues, uh, massive medical bills, they've had to take off extended time from work, and guess what, they sue me. Can't blame them for, for doing that, given the fact that I'm the person who got them to be so sick. Um, but they're suing me for more than $100,000, for more than the amount that I have invest in the business. They find out that I'm actually worth almost, you know, if you take out the $100,000, for almost $10 million. And they think to themselves, yeah, I ought to be able to get that money because after all, Groover made me sick. And so they don't sue me for just the amount of my investment. They also sue me for my entire net worth. Sir, if I, depending upon the business entity I choose, it may be that they are going to be able to get my $9.9 .9 million if they persuade the jury that um, I am culpable and that they are, their damages merit that type of payment. But some other business entities will preclude them from getting any of the money other than the money that I invested. So this is always going to be in jeopardy, the amount I invested. But this amount sometimes will be in jeopardy and sometimes it won't be. And as you can see, this is a huge factor in the business entity that you select. This is probably the single most important factor that business entrepreneurs uh, consider as they're trying to choose which business entity to take. Now, I'll be honest with you, um, this is a bigger deal if you're Warren Buffett or Bill Gates or Mark Cuban who's thinking about starting a business than if it's somebody who's uh, you know 20 or 22 years old who you know owns a car and has you know $500 in their checking account. Uh, that person uh, doesn't really have a lot at risk because they don't have $10 million. Maybe they've got a net worth of $4,000 or $10,000, maybe not even that much. And so Honestly, they don't really, they're not a very appealing person to sue, not like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett would be. So part of the importance of managing unlimited, unlimited liability or managing this risk is considering how realistic this risk is. Of course, 
the reality is that Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and Mark Cuban didn't start out being multi billionaires. They started out, I'm guessing, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm guessing as pretty ordinary people. Um, you know, probably people who had college debt and who had, um, you know, who are living at least to some extent paycheck to paycheck at some point in their lives. And so, even if you don't start your business being overly concerned about managing the risks to your net worth over time, for hopefully you'll get to the point where that will become a big issue. So let's talk about which one of these entities our net worth is in jeopardy. And they are this one and this one and sometimes this one, depending upon the circumstances. We'll talk about that in a second. So you can see that the first ones we're going to cover are the ones that are most risky in terms of managing that, 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 that personal liability. There are no limitations on personal liability. These other tools, these last three, the only thing if I were to, to have these, those business entities, the only thing I would be risking would be my investment, my $100,000. Even, um, well, we won't manage all, all those issues, but, but that's the... That's the big distinction here. So this is a huge drawback to sole proprietorship, this unlimited liability. An advantage, of course, is that it's very easy to set up. I mean, there's literally nothing you have to do to set it up. It is the default say There's no paperwork you have to file with the state. There's no uh, documents you have to file in order to create a, a, a sole proprietorship. Now, I say that there are no forms you have to file, and that's both true and untrue. It is true that there are no particular forms you have to file be, in order to create a sole proprietorship. But there are forms and, and documents you have to create in order to start any business, whether it be a sole proprietorship, a general partnership, a limited partnership, a limited liability partnership, a limited liability company or corporation, or another more unusual a business structure. So the, the, the particular paperwork you need to file that I'm about to talk about isn't unique to any of these formats. All businesses require them. So yes, you have to do this paperwork in order to have a sole proprietorship, but not because it's a sole proprietorship, but because it's a business. So let's look at those and you'll find those right over here. So we are in our um, canvas for chapter 21 and we have a, um, uh, four examples of these types of forms that we need. The first is the Texas Assumed Name Certificate. Now, technically, this isn't a required document. Um, this applies when, click on this, when you want to um, run your business under a name that is not um, your legal business. So let's assume for a second that you're a sole proprietorship. So your name of your business is your name. So my, in my case, my name would be Cynthia Groover. But you know what? I'm not very good at selling tacos, but I'm pretty sure Cynthia Groover is not going to sell me a lot of tacos. People don't think Germans are good at tacos. And they're probably right. That's probably when my business failed, right? So I'm going to want to um, make it sound more appealing. So I might call it Cindy's Tacos. That might work. But my name isn't Cindy's Tacos. My name isn't even Cindy. And so because I'm going to uh, do business under an assumed name, I'm going to want to fill out an assumed name certificate. And so here are, here's the, the information about how to proceed with respect to that. So um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to make you aware that many, many businesses don't, um, the, the name that they uh, present to their customers is not necessarily their legal name. And this isn't just for sole proprietorships. It could be, let me give another example. Let's say that I decide I'm going to create a corporation and I name my corporation um, Groover Restaurant Corporation. Maybe I'm thinking I'm going to start with a taco shop, but I'm also, I want to eventually get into uh, maybe having a ice cream parlor 
um, maybe a pizza place, and I like barbecue too. So this is the name I'm going to start with, Groover Restaurants Corporation. But again, this isn't exactly the type of name that you think, oh, this would be great on the marquee of a, a uh, restaurant. Uh, you know, that's not the type of name you see outside of a restaurant. So I'm probably going to need to name each one of my tacos something else. So maybe I decide to name this. Um, I, I'm going to name it uh, Maria's Tacos. Maybe I think that more people want to buy tacos from someone named Maria than from somebody named Cindy. And then when I am selling ice cream, I might choose uh, to name it Sven's ice cream. I guess the idea is people from a cold part of the world might be better at making ice cream. I don't know if that's true. And when I am doing the pizza place, I might choose to name it um, um, uh, what's an Italian name? Giuseppe's. I don't know how to spell Giuseppe. <laughs> okay, so this is close. I apologize if you have a family member named Giuseppe. But Giuseppe's Pizza. So you can see how I might customize it. A, a, a restaurant business that we see that with is um, the um, Papa's restaurants. There's Papa Do's. But by the way, the Papa's family is a Greek family from Houston. And their name is Papa's. The, it's not plural. That's just the way the name is. So they have changed their name to reflect different ethnicities. Because they figure, well, we might be able to sell a lot of Greek food with a name like Papa's, but we're probably not going to sell as much Cajun food. But if we make it sound Cajun, people will want to buy. So Papa Do's, and then we have Papa Cito's. Again, they're taking Papa's and making it So that's an example of kind of the same format that we've been talking about here. They also have I guess, the Papa Steakhouse, which they've kept with their original name. And in Houston, there's even more of those style. Anyway, so this is an example of a document that you may well want to fill out if you choose to have an assumed name. Let's go back to the other documents that we might want to have. Here we go. Okay, we will need an employer identification number. That is the EIN. Um, if we're going to have any employees in our business, I mean, this is so how we so, so we can report to the um, IRS um, the various tax monies that we will be paying on behalf of our employees and that we will be withholding on behalf of our employees. And so. We need to request one of those numbers. Again, we don't need this if we don't have employees, but if we have an employee, no matter what style of business we have, we'll need to have an EIN. We'll need to have a Texas sales tax permit if we are going to be uh, selling items. Again, doesn't matter the format of the business, sole proprietorship or some other format. And here's some information about how to go about doing that. And then we have this is uh, the sketch. This is an IRS schedule. Schedule C is for sole proprietor. So this is specific to the sole proprietor. Uh, path. This is how you uh, report the profits and losses of the business 
on your income tax return. There isn't a legal distinction between the business and the individual who owns the business. So it's all reported together. So that's the ins and outs of the uh, unique, uh, of, I guess, aspects of the sole proprietorship. And again, those forms that we covered were not necessarily unique to the sole proprietorship. They were just bit forms that you need generally. Let's talk about another um, advantage to sole proprietorships, and that is pass-through taxation treatment. There are two primary ways, and, and I'm making this overly simple. So I, I, for those of you out that um, are accounting uh, majors, you may say that you, you, you fairly would be saying that I, I'm oversimplifying this, but to keep it simple, there's kind of two buckets that entities fall into. Um, they can have pass-through taxation treatment or they can have double taxation treatment. In most circumstances, pass-through taxation treatment is more desirable than double taxation. You can kind of almost hear it in the name, who wants to be taxed twice? Um, Pass-through taxation is a single taxing event. And so while it's not 100% of the time that pass-through taxation treatment is better, more often than not it is. So what does it mean when we say pass-through taxation? It means that if our business is profitable, the taxes are not, uh, the, the profits from the business are not taxed by the, ent um, the entity itself doesn't pay the taxes, but the owners pay the taxes, or in this case, the owner, because it's a sole proprietorship. Um, and so that's generally going to be a favored treatment. And so that's a good thing about sole proprietorship. So we have two good things here, easy to, for, to create with very few uh, paper or essentially no paperwork issues, good tax treatment, but we have this negative unlimited liability. Now this one is kind of ambiguous. It's both positive and negative. I mean, it's positive in the sense that most entrepreneurs like to do things their own way. It's negative in though that um, it requires that the sole proprietor be an expert in everything. And relatively few of us are experts in everything. They need to be experts in marketing. They need to be experts in um, creating whatever the product is. They need to have good customer service. Um, they need to be you know, organized. They have to be able to keep the books. I mean, there's, as you can see in this picture, lots of things going on and relatively few of us are good at all of those things. Now it is true if you're a sole proprietor, you can employ people to do those tasks. So it's not absolutely certain that you have to do them all, but during the early stages, most likely you will be doing most of them. And so, that can be both a bane and not such a good thing. Okay, so here's a kind of a simple hmm. Oh, here we go. Clear. Um Here's just a kind of a simple um, illustration of the advantages and the disadvantages. I guess one of the disadvantages we haven't talked about is the funding idea. Um, it is somewhat difficult to raise money as a sole proprietorship. Um, some of the common ways that businesses own money aren't going to be available to you if you stay in the sole proprietorship mode. For example, a common way to raise money is to sell parts of your business. And so the person who buys it get, gives you money, gives you capital, but then now instead of you owning 100%, you only own 50% or you only own 70%. But of course, as soon as you sell part of your business, you're no longer a sole proprietorship. So that avenue isn't available to you if you want to stay as a sole proprietor. Um, and as a result, it can be more difficult to raise money. Now you, of course, can still do things like um, uh, uh, get loans, uh, use your own money to, uh, uh, you know, fund the business, uh, but it can be a challenge. And certainly, once a, a business gets beyond a certain point, this is going to uh, perhaps more seriously curtail your ability to grow. So, um, as a result of these uh, disadvantages, the primary ones being the, un the uh, unlimited the lack of limitations on personal liability and the difficulties raising fund, 
most businesses don't stay sole proprietorships for very long. In fact, I would uh, suggest to you that most businesses of, of sophisticated um, entrepreneurs are probably never a sole proprietorship once the business is really going. So we're going to talk about this next group. We're going to talk about the partnerships group together. We're going to talk about general partnerships, limited partnerships, and limited liability partnerships. But before we talk about any one of these separately, we're going to talk about the general concept of partnership. So the, the next slide is going to talk about kind of all and partnership in general terms, kind of addressing all three of these. So let's go to the next slide. So what is a partnership? A partnership is a voluntary association. This is an important idea, voluntary. We get to choose who we want to partner with in a business. Um, as a general rule, the government isn't going to tell somebody, you have to become a business partner with that person. We get to say, no, thank you. Um, in fact, there's more flexibility in entering into a partnership than there are, is in terms of hiring employees or servicing customers. Uh, we may not be able to say no thank you to serving that customer or no thank you to hiring that employee, but we can um, pretty readily, I'm not going to say without any limitations, but, but easier saying no, I would prefer not to partner with that particular person. So there's more flexibility. And in a way that makes sense because the relationship, both the duration and the depth and the legal significance of the relationship of a partnership is oftentimes greater than those other relationships. The second thing that's important is that you need at least two partners. Uh, there's no such thing as a sole proprietorship partnership. Um, if you only have one owner, it can't be a partnership. It would then be a sole proprietorship. You have to have at least two. Let's say you start out with two. Bob and Larry decide they're going to open up a taco shop, and it's going to be, um, they're going to call it Barry's Tacos. Um, and uh, they have the business up for six months, and Larry decides this is he's had enough tacos. He's going to get out of the business. He sells his interest to Bob. Bob continues on um, the Barry's Taco Place. Well, now there's a single owner. So it might have been a partnership when Bob and Larry were there together, but the second Larry leaves the business, it has become a sole proprietorship. You have to have two. Um, that's what creates the partnership, and as soon as you get below two, then it is no longer a partnership. Of course, you can have more than two. In fact, I would say many, I mean, a large portion of partnerships do have more than two, and there is no upward limit. I mean, you could, in theory, have thousands of partners, although that's probably a, a bit unusual. Another thing about partnership is that it's for profit. Uh, some of the other entities we're going to talk about aren't always for profit. You can have a nonprofit motive for some of these businesses, but there's no such thing as a nonprofit partnership. Now, people use the term partnership colloquially or informally in everyday conversation, and so a person might say something like a nonprofit partnership, but they're not referring to the legal entity in that situation. And so when you're talking about the legal term, a nonprofit partnership is an oxymoron. It's like saying the walking dead. Well, either somebody's dead or they could be walking, but they can't be both. Similarly, a partnership can be a partnership, or it can be nonprofit, but it can't be both. As we said before, as we talked about on this slide over here, there's going to be three types of partnerships we're going to talk about. Um, general partnerships, which we'll talk about next, which is a subcategory of this you know, larger umbrella idea partnership. We'll talk about limited partnerships, which are called LPs and limited liability partnerships, which are LLPs. When we talked about a sole proprietorship, we said how there didn't need to be a document to create it, and that is true. And with partnerships, at least with this first type of partnership, general partnership, there is also no need for a document. But at a minimum, you have at least one other person involved, and so it makes sense, certainly, to have a document to memorialize the agreement so there won't be a disagreement when, when people get mad at one another and they have different recollections about how they intended to create the partnership, it's easy for there to be litigation and disputes over it. Better than to memorialize whatever the deal is at the very beginning when everybody's friends and everybody's uh, in a position to think through exactly how they want to handle the matter. Um, it also, the act of writing things out also causes everybody to sit down and think, 
Well, what would we do in that situation? Well, what would we do when this happened? Well, what if we need to bring more partners in? If you're just talking about it, but not writing it down, you may not be motivated to anticipate all the different issues that can come up and probably will come up at some point in the business. If you don't figure those out beforehand and then there's some kind of falling out and now you have to figure it out, um, it may not be possible because the parties are so angry at each other that it may not be possible to come up with an agreement. You end up in litigation that costs money and time and frustration. Better to have answered those questions at the beginning in writing than to wait at the end. So a, a written document isn't required, but it's certainly a smart idea. And that document is often called Articles of Partnership. And it's what's most likely going to create the partnership, although, as I say, it doesn't have to have a writing. So what are some characteristics of partnerships? Well, one of the most important is the idea of, of a fiduciary duty that both partners or all the partners have toward each other. What is a fiduciary duty? Well, here's a definition. It's a legal obligation of one party to act in the best interest of another party. Uh, this, the idea is that you're not just looking out for yourself. You're not saying, look, I think right now it's in my best interest to be your partner. And so that's why I'm entering into the partnership. I mean, that may be what you, what you think, but that's not satisfying your fiduciary duty. Uh, representing your own best interest is not um, an adequate um, way to act when you have a fiduciary duty. You have to also act in the other guys, and if there's more than one guy or girl, in everyone's best interest. So let's imagine this scenario. Um, Bob and Larry have Barry's taco stand, and the business is going along pretty good. Um, Bob and Larry have been thinking about opening up a second branch. Their first branch is in Plano, now they're thinking about opening one up in McKinney. About the same time, Bob gets a call from his uh, friend, uh, Suzanne. And Suzanne um, has been interested in opening up a taco shop as well. And she has just kind of lucked into this really great location. And she wants to enter into this uh, taco stand business with Bob. But honestly, Suzanne can't stand Larry. And so Bob knows that Suzanne is not going to be willing to bring Larry into this deal. Anyway, so Suzanne says to Bob, hey, let's open up um, a um, taco stand called Sari's, Sari's Tacos. Well, Bob knows that he and Larry have been planning on opening up a taco stand in McKinney and the, position, the place that um, Suzanne has found for her taco stand is just about exactly the area that Bob and Larry have been talking about. Bob also knows that while tacos are very popular in McKinney, uh, he, it, won't, it won't be able to support uh, multiple taco stands in a small geographic area. So if uh, Bob proceeds with Suzanne and they go ahead with this taco stand, it's really going to mean that Bob and Larry aren't going to be able to have a taco stand in the same area. Um, under those circumstances, Bob might logically conclude that it's in his best interest, he, the individual, to um, enter into this agreement with Suzanne. But there would be a good argument that Larry would have that, that by doing so, Bob is breaching his fiduciary duty to Larry because he's not acting in Larry's best interest entering into this agreement with Suzanne. So that's an example about how a fiduciary duty plays out. And there are other duties. Um, there's a duty of obedience within the partnership. So if the partnership has agreed to a certain course of action and they, let's say Bob and Larry together have decided uh, that they want their taco stand to be on the feeder road um, along 75 between Virginia and 380 or just north of 380. That's the zone that they uh, want their taco stand to be in. And so they both have agreed to it. The partnership has spoken. And now it's Larry's job to go out and find a place. Well, actually, Larry finds a place um, off of El Dorado, about half a mile from 75. So the location is south of where the partnership had agreed that the location should be. 
and it's not off of 75. But Larry thinks it's the best place, given the rent and the location in the neighborhood, for them to establish their second taco stand. So Larry signs a lease. Well, Larry has broken his duty of obedience because he's entered into this agreement that what well, isn't in keeping with the uh, decision that the partnership has made. Instead, what Larry should have gone is gone back to the partnership and talked to the partners, in this case, just he and Bob, and say, hey, I know we decided we we're going to do it this way, but let me tell you about this great deal I found here, and let me explain to you why I think this is better. And then Bob and Larry and any of the partners can talk about it and say, well, gosh, yeah, that's a great point. We hadn't thought about that. Oh, sure. Yeah, let's do that. And so in that situation, once the partnership changes its mind, now Larry can comply with the duty of obedience and sign the uh, lease in that um, other shopping center. And then there's also a duty of care to the other partners. That's pretty consistent with the duties that we've already talked about. Um, all good things must come to an end, as they say, and mark partnerships are going to uh, be some of the things that do come to an end. Um, and the dissolution process goes through, uh, or the, the ending of a partnership has kind of two phases. The first is the dissolution, and you can see dissolution is similar to the word dissolve, and uh, this is when the assets of the partnership are liquidated. And then the winding up is the second stage, and this is when the partnership itself actually ends. The partnership itself no longer exists. All of these things that we've talked about are true for all three of our partnerships. Now we're going to go in and talk about the differences between each one of our three. And the first one we're going to talk about is a general partnership. And again, the reason that we talk about it second after a sole proprietorship is because it's the second most easy, most straightforward business entity that we are going to be talking about today. So what is a general partnership? Well, of course, first of all, it's a partnership. So uh, this is our background definition. But now we're going to talk about, oops, sorry, about... Um, so a partnership is a voluntary association between two or more persons who co-own a business for profit. And But before we go on, let me just talk for a second about the word persons. I know we've talked about this before, but I think it bears repeating. When you see the word persons in the law, we aren't talking just about humans. We're talking about humans, but we're also talking about other entities, corporations, other partners, uh, partnerships. Um, I'll just say businesses, but it can be lots of different things. So you can, you know, Ford Motor Company and Uber could enter into a partnership uh, to create a new type of uh, car that would be very good for um, Uber business purposes or whatever. Um, and so they would be in a partnership. I'm guessing Uber is a, in a corporation. I guess it's a corporation. Certainly Ford is a corporation. So two corporations together could become a partnership. They would remain corporations separately, but the business that they have involved in the partnership would be a partnership. All right. So let's go. And so this is what a partnership is. Now we're going to talk about a particular flavor of partnership. And if you think about it from the perspective of flavor, you know, we can talk about well, what is ice cream. And then we can talk about, well, what is chocolate ice cream or what is strawberry ice cream or what is, you know, uh, Rocky Road ice cream. Well, the, uh, obviously all of those types of ice cream are, are ice cream. They just have a, a particular um, twist on that concept. So let's talk about the first type of, of, uh, category of partnership and this is a general partnership. So it's a partnership and in this particular partnership the partners divide profits and management responsibility and share unlimited personal liability for the partnership's debt. So we have unlimited personal liability. Where have we seen that before? Well we saw it before on our sole proprietorship, right? Unlimited personal liability. So this is a similarity between sole proprietorship and general, propri general partnership. In fact, a general partnership is essentially just a sole proprietorship on steroids. It's just like it, except it's bigger, it's more. It has more than one owner. So going back to um, my example, um, again, Cynthia Griever is establishing a taco stand. Um, I have that $10 million in the bank. I decided to invest $100,000. i am a sole proprietorship because I didn't file any paperwork with anybody other than those forms I needed to start any business. 
um, I'm in the business for a year or two. This time it's more successful. And I have uh, somebody come to me and say, listen, uh, Groover, you're, I like your business model. I think it's successful. I think we can grow it more. I would like to participate in it. I would like to be your partner. Um, I know a little bit more about running the restaurant side of the business or, or whatever the, the twist, what that person can add. Anyway, this person is Bob. And I listen to his proposal and I say, yeah, that sounds good. I think we ought to enter into a partnership. Um, if you'll bring $100,000 into the business, we'll now have $200,000 and we'll be able to open up another taco stand and it's going to result in significantly greater profits for us. So a good, good plan for us. But we don't decide to memorialize the agreement. Um, I mean, we might. We might write up an Articles of, of Partnership, but we may not either. And we ha if, even if we do do an, do an Articles of Partnership, we don't do anything else. So what's happened is my sole proprietorship has morphed into a general partnership. Um, but really, the only difference is the number of owners. All the other aspects of a sole proprietorship are still pretty much in effect. So um, the assumption with a general pro uh, partnership is that each one of the partners has equal control of the business. Now this assumption can be overturned by the written articles of incorporation, sorry, articles of partnership that the parties actually um, prepare. So let's go back to the example. In my example, I contributed $100,000 and Bob contributed $100,000. So probably in that situation, we probably share our profits and control 50-50. But let me switch things up. Let's say Bob contributed $500,000 and I'm only going to contribute $100,000. Well, it's also quite possible that the decision might be, well, that Bob ought to have a greater say in how the business is run since he has more money at stake. On the other hand, maybe he's not going to be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business, but I am. So it doesn't always turn on the amount of money that a business, that a person invests. It might be also the sweat equity that, or the expertise that he or she is investing. Uh, but again, that's an essential question for the uh, partners to decide very early on how, what level of control, what, how's the profits be, are going to be shared in that business. Obviously, that's not an issue in a sole proprietorship because there's just one owner. Um, because of the liability concerns that, uh, that no limitations on liability, many times a business that is a general partnership will change into a different entity, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. This becomes a greater and greater concern. Let's talk about why it's a greater concern for general partners than it is for um, uh, sole proprietors. Uh, go, let's go back to our, my taco stand. Let's assume I had no employees. It's probably not too realistic for a restaurant, but let's assume it just for the sake of argument. Well, I said that, I was, uh, that, that one of the, the features of a sole proprietorship was um, unlimited liability. Um, and so let's say I spoil the food. I leave things out. Um, and as a result, people get sick and then they sue me. Well, the reality is they could have sued me even if I had had a corporation because I messed up. I left the food out. It was my carelessness, Cynthia Gruber's error that caused these people to get sick. And no matter what business entity I create, my um, negligence, my tortious behavior will never be forgiven. I'm always going to be on the on the hook for that. So the business entity structure isn't going to insulate me from my bad, tortious decisions. What it will insulate me from, if I pick a different entity other than a sole proprietorship, is it may insulate me from the bad decisions of somebody else. So let's think about my sole proprietorship again. This time, I have two employees. One is named Bob and one is named Teresa. I'm not able to be there all the time. Sometimes Bob's there, sometimes Teresa's there, sometimes I'm there. On this particular day, even though I've trained Bob and Teresa about food safety, I've um, provided all the training and all of the um, refrigeration space and, and all the appropriate equipment that is necessary for Bob and Teresa to keep the food um, very, very safe. Um, it just so happens that Bob is a careless guy and he isn't paying attention. He leaves out the ground meat on the counter and it gets too warm and it spoils, but he still goes ahead and uses it and cooks 
um, the tacos with it. And as a result, people get sick and we have all these bad outcomes. And so the, but Bob, you know, he doesn't have a significant net worth. So the people who get sick, I mean, you know, they think to themselves, really, what's the point of sending Bob? He doesn't have any money. And um, I, what I, the person I really want to sue is at Cynthia Groover because she has $10 million in her bank account. Well, if I'm a sole proprietor, it doesn't really matter that I'm not the person who made the bad decision that made those people sick. I'm the owner of the business, and anything that happens in the business, I'm going to be liable for. Now, of course, if they got sick from somebody else's tacos, I'm not going to be liable for that. Um, or if they brought my tacos home and left the, the tacos on the counter for two days, and then they ate them and got sick because of their own carelessness, I'm not responsible for that. But if I'm responsible, if, if the business is responsible for what happened, then I'm going to be on the hook if it's a sole proprietorship or a general partnership. So let's talk about why a general partnership is even more risky than a sole proprietorship. It's not in theory more risky, but as a practical matter, it's usually going to be more risky. And that is that as soon as you get into a general partnership, you're usually thinking about a bigger business than a sole proprietorship. After all, you have more than one owner now. As a result, you're probably going to have, I mean, you certainly have at least two employees now, or not employees, or partners or not employees, but two people in the business. And so um, that combined with the employees that you have, and, and very likely you'll have more employees in a partnership than you would in a sole proprietorship, there's more people who can make bad decisions. There's more people who can do bad things. And uh, as a result, there's a greater concern. When you're a sole proprietor, you might think to yourself, well, gosh, if I make a mistake, I'm going to be personally liable anyway, so who really cares about whether it's a sole proprietor or something else? But now that you have three or four or five people, you can legitimately start thinking, wow, I'm not going to make a mistake, but I don't know about these other people. I mean, I'm going to try to be careful and hire smart people and careful people, but you know, I'm not them, and I don't know everything they're thinking about or doing, and so I need to protect myself. Um, as the part, as the business grows, there's going to be more and more and more people. Let's pause for a moment and think about Arthur Anderson. Arthur Anderson was a major accounting firm, and um, it uh, failed because of uh, decisions made by um, just a handful of partners in the Arthur Anderson business, um, at, where it's located in Houston, it related to the Enron uh, case. Uh, I won't go into the specifics, but uh, some behaviors that were per perceived to be or deemed to be unethical um, uh, with the partners of this accounting firm. And as a result, the whole accounting firm failed. The vast majority of the employees of Arthur Anderson, even the vast majority of the partners of Arthur Anderson had no involvement with the misconduct, had no knowledge of the misconduct, probably didn't even know the wrongdoers. But the whole business failed in um, as a result of the, the choices made by these handful of people. So you know, there's just that inherent risk when you're looking at um, uh, unlim a lack of limitations on liability. Now, Arthur Anderson's situation is more complex than what I'm saying, but you, I'm just kind of demonstrating to you, uh, in theory, kind of what the, where the risks are there. Okay. Um, a good thing about general partners, and this is, again, similar to the a sole proprietorship, is that pass-through taxation status. The partnership itself pays no taxes. The profits are passed through to the partners themselves. So here we have the advantages and disadvantages, and you'll be able to see that it tracks very closely with sole proprietorship because basically it is a sole proprietorship just with more than one owner. It's easy to create. It's a little bit harder than sole proprietorship because you do have to work something out between your partner. Um, uh, then we, we have some additional tax benefits where business losses can qualify for tax deduction, but the big the big disadvantage is going to be that unlimited personal liability. Okay, so we've talked about the first type of partnership, general partnership. We're going to go on and talk about a second type of partnership, limited partnership, LPs. LPs are not as popular as they once were in the 1980s. They were pretty ridiculously popular, and I think you'll see 
why they were popular in comparison to a general partnership. So this presentation is almost more historic than practical today, but it helps you kind of see the evolution a little bit. So let's go on and talk about a limited partnership. Of course, the first thing to know about a limited partnership is that it is a partnership, just like any other partnership. So it has all those characteristics that we uh, read about before. Just a little reminder, let's go back and look at them for a second. What is a partnership? It's a voluntary association between two or more persons who co-own a business for profit. So this particular flavor of partnership, a limited partnership, is a partnership that consists of at least, and we're gonna see two classes. We have one general partner. I'll put that one in red. And we'll put, and at least one limited partner. So we have two classes of partners. With a general partnership, we only had one class of partner. So this is a difference. We have one, at least one general partner and at least one limited partner in which the general partner assumes all liability for the partnership's debts and the limited partners assume no liability beyond their originally invested capital. So you can see it makes sense that we call general partners general partners because they're acting just like the partners do in a general partnership because they have unlimited personal liability. So they are just like, so these general partners in a limited partnership are just like partners in a general partnership. They have unlimited liability. This isn't new. This is what we, we've seen and, and would have expected. This is our new wrinkle, that there's this other class of partner and their liability situation is different. So let's go back to our taco example. Again, Cynthia Groover, she wants to invest $100,000 in a taco stand. She runs into Bob. Bob is also wanting to establish a taco business. Bob says, hey, why don't we establish a limited partnership? I'll be the general partner, you be the limited partner. You'll contribute $100,000 in capital. I'll contribute $100,000 in capital. I'll run the business on a day-to-day -day basis. I will make managerial decisions. I will operate and control the nature of the business. You are going to be the silent partner. You aren't gonna be involved. You're just the money woman, money guy. And that's the term silent partner. You may have heard of that before. That's what, how we use it to talk about limited partnerships. If some, somehow or another something awful happens with the business and you know, we get some kind of you know, multi-million dollar judgment against us, you, the limitations on your liability will be just the amount of money you invested, $100,000. On the other hand, I will have unlimited risk. Um, I will also invest $100,000. I could lose that. But I also have a net worth of, we'll say, $2 million. I could lose all of that as well. So you can see the two categories of liability. This is the first type of entity that we've talked about that requires the, uh, the business owners to do something. The business has to file particular documents in order to create an LP. If, they, if the two or more people, partners want to create a limited partnership and don't file the right paperwork, guess what? They have failed. They have instead created a general partnership because general partnership is the default setting when there's more than one owner. But if the partners file the right paperwork, dot the I's, cross the T's according to state law, then they will create an LP. Let's just pause here for a second and we'll go to the website so we can see what that, how that website works works, I guess. I'm going to go to Secretary of State, Texas. Every state has a Secretary of State, and this is where you file these types of documents. So here we're going to go into, and in most states it's similar to this. We can see currently um, Secretary Pablos is the um, Secretary. And so we'll go to business filings. And you can see they actually provide uh, for lay people a lot of leads. So you can actually find out stuff like, um, 
here's business startup information. So let's just flip on this so you can see. So this will tell you, hey, here's about sole proprietorship. Well, here's about general partnership. Wait a second, I'm thinking about a limited partnership. How about a limited liability partnership? No, a limited liability company. Well, how about a corporation? Well, how about an S corporation? So all the entities we're talking about, the, uh, the state of Texas will give you kind of a, a cheat sheet information about that. Uh, but more importantly, there's the forms that you need to file. Uh, so again, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go to the business nonprofit forms. And we can see we have a limited partnership. So here we are at uh, 306. We have a limited partnership application for registration. We have a certificate of formation for a limited partnership. So those are just two examples of forms that you might need to complete with respect to limited partnership. I'm not going to go back to the sheet to this website in the future, um, but just you can see here that all the forms you would need. Now here we have it for a limited liability company, which we'll talk about later. We also have, this is for a professional limited liability company. We could have it for um, another, a, a non-professional, sounds like it's unprofessional, uh, a, a limited liability company not intended for professionals. We have um, a professional association, this is for medical professionals. We have a professional corporation, this is for, say, attorneys. We have nonprofit corporations, because again, a, a corporation can be nonprofit, a partnership can't. We have a certificate formation for for-profit companies. Um, and so these are some examples of, of the forms that you might be filling out. I'm not going to go back to this website, but let me just pull one up so you can see what it looks like. I'm going to pull it up in Word. And just to show you how easy these are to, to work through, it gives you detailed instructions about each one of the sections. And then the form itself is super easy. You give the name of the form. You give who is going to be the registered agent, who is going to be the general partner. You're probably just going to have one. Um, you don't even have to list um, the, the limited partners. What's going to be the principal play address? When is it going to go into effect? Um, and you have a signature for each one of the general partners. So, um, I mean, honestly, it uh, probably would take you 15 minutes to fill out the whole form, and you don't need an attorney to be successful at, fi at filling it out by any means. Okay, so let's go back to our um, business entities. So we've talked about the general partner. We talked about the fact that he or she is going to be running the business, and the limited partner has limitations on liability. But the exchange for him having those limitations on liability is that he cannot exercise managerial authority. In fact, if he tries and he's successful, he puts in his jeopardy his limited partnership status. So let's go back to the example. Bob has suggested that we enter into a limited partnership. I'm investing 100000 but I'm not going to be involved in the business. But you know what? I just can't stand not being involved. So I go to the store every day, and I'm looking over the shoulders of the uh, people making the tacos and selling the tacos. And in fact, I start telling them, well, you know what? I'm an owner of the business. Um, we need to do things differently. We need to add these menu items. We need to advertise in this way. And my the statements that I make actually go into effect. Well, very possibly, I have now become a general partner. Even though the paperwork indicates I'm a limited partner, um, because I'm exercising managerial control, I've lost my limited status. So therefore, if the partnership is sued, those people suing us might be able to get at my $10 million. So you have to watch it. Limited partner needs to stay limited. We need to have the name limited in the name of the entity. This is what we call a signal. This is the first entity we've talked about that has a signal. All of the rest of our entities will have signals. And the signal's purpose is to signal to the general public, to vendors, to customers, to the general public, the nature of the business, that there are some limitations on liability of the owners. 
Um, so uh, we'll see lots of, of signals along the lines, but a, a, a common one in this particular situation is the word limited. So um, the name of our entity might be, um, we'll say Berries Tacos Limited, and we might abbreviate it LTD. And what that tells the consumer is, oh, wait a second. Um, if I get botulism or E. coli here and I sue Barry's Tacos, I'm not going to be able to successfully sue the limited partners for the uh, money that they have, that they have chosen not to invest in the business. That's the signal that the customer is getting. Now, as a practical matter, I'm guessing when you go deciding which restaurant to go to, you don't consider things like the legal name of the business and what its signal at the end of its name is. Most of us don't make decisions on that basis. But in theory, we have the ability to make those decisions. And so having that signal tells the world what the liability status of the entity is. Just like with a general partner, we have pass-through taxation status. So you can see that limited partnership is a better deal for the limited partner than the general partnership. Um, the limited partner, which is usually the majority of the partners, is going to have limitations on liability. But there is the trade-off that the limited partner can't be involved in the day-to-day -day managing of the business. So you can see how that when there were only two flavors of partnership, general partnership and limited partnership, you can see how some general partnerships would transition to limited partnership. Um, again, this is an example, this kind of schema kind of shows you um, the differing uh, relationships that, that, can, that, that exist within a limited partnership. Okay, so now we're going to go on to our third flavor of partnerships. This is LLP. This is the rock star of the partnership world. Um, and so we'll see how it is Definitely better than this one, and definitely better than this one. In fact, there's really no argument to have any other type of partnership other than an LLP. There's good arguments for, for uh, choosing a corporation over an LLP or choosing an LLC over an LLP, but there really aren't any good arguments for choosing a general partnership over an LLP or a limited partnership over an LLP. I guess the only advantage this one is it's easier to establish. So, uh, But other than that kind of brief moment at the beginning where you might be being lazy, there really is no reason to have anything other than an LLP. So let's talk about why it's so awesome and amazing. So here's our definition. Again, it's a, a limited liability partnership is a partnership. So let's go back and look at that definition one more time. What is a partnership? It's a voluntary association between two or more persons, not just human beings, but persons, who co-own a business for profit. So all those things have to be true. And, but there's two more things that have to be true. Each one of the partners, not just a, a category of partners, but each one of the partners has no personal liability for the misconduct of another partner and no personal liability for the contractual obligations of the partnership. There is just one class of partners and they are all being treated essentially as if they were limited partners. So they're treated as if they're limited partners, but they get to manage the business like they're general partners. So they get the advantages of being a general partner and the advantages of getting, being limited partners. It's the best of both worlds. It's amazing. Now, the textbook provides a little bit different definition in this area. For this class, I would ask that you focus on my definition since I'm the one writing the test, so this is a strategy. Um, questions that you might be doing on homework would, of course, be based upon the textbook definition. It's not that my definition, the textbook definition conflict. I just think mine's a little bit easier to process. Okay, so just like the LPs, the LLPs, Limited Liability Partnerships, which by the way, as you can see, this name is a mouthful, right? How many syllables? Limited Liability Partnerships. That's 11 syllables. As a result, people don't say that whole name very many times. They've abbreviated LLP. So that's what I'll be saying. But whenever I say that, think this mouthful. 
Okay, so just like the LPs, we'll, we'll establish an LLP in the same way. There are fees associated with LLPs. In Texas, the fees can be a little bit on the steep side. And there's the paperwork. So it's not exactly a cost-free enterprise. But it's pretty rare that the cost of establishing the partnership is um, in a serious impediment to whether you establish this one or that. And we need not just the word limited, as we did with an LP, but we need the whole title limited liability partnership because um, the liability situation is different for an LLP than it is for an LP because there's no general partner with an LLP. So you have to have limited liability partnership or more likely LLP in the name of the business. Again, it's that signal to the general public. This is a new business entity. It was created in 1991 and we invented it. Yay to us. Texas was the first to create it. Just like all the other entities we've talked about to this date, it enjoys that pass through taxation status. The partnership itself doesn't pay taxes. It's the partners who pay taxes on the profits from the partnership. So super cool and amazing. Now, um, there is a subcategory of limited liability partnerships called professional limited liability partnerships. And we saw, I guess, a little bit of it when we were on the Social, uh, uh, Secretary of State website. Uh, these uh, PLLPs are designed for um, uh, accountants, uh, doctors, um, uh, lawyers, um, other professionals. Uh, engineers, other professionals who establish um, a limited liability partnership. Texas, though, I guess because we were the first, we initially only created an LLP for, uh, style. Uh, I think the reason that we created only an LLP style initially was the thought that we thought that pretty much all LLPs would be established by professionals. So it would be almost redundant to put a P on it because everyone would be like, why would you put a P on it? I mean, the only people who do LLPs are professionals anyway. So, you know, it's, it's like saying that ice cream is icy. Well, duh, hello. Um, but what we discovered in Texas and what the rest of the country discovered when they imitated us by creating these entities as well, is that a lot of businesses that were not professional businesses, and when I say they're not professional, I don't mean that they were unprofessional, I don't mean that they were, you know, doing bad things, but they just weren't in one of those professions that we treat differently. So many people that weren't in the professions, for example, let's say I wanted to open up a taco stand, perfectly honorable business to do, but it's not a profession. And I, maybe I decided to establish it through an LLP, perfectly good plan. Um, so I would have established it with LLP as my initials. That was the only flavor in Texas. But Texas started saying, hey, wait a second, we're having all these non-professionals forming LLPs, we need to distinguish professional LLPs from the garden variety LLP. So we're going to make professionals put a P in front of the, their LLP. Um, and so that's, that's what happened. And so recently formed um, professional LLPs will have after their name, let's say it's you know, Smith and Brown P LLP. Um, entities that became LLPs at, during the initial wave before we had this alternative were grandfathered. They don't have to add the P if they don't want to. They can, but they don't have to. So you will find law firms especially that made the transition soon. And not surprisingly, the law firms are the ones who made this quick change because, you know, they're the legal experts. And so many of them, the ones that existed back in 1991, are still called LLPs to this day. But they're governed by the rules of the PLLP. So we've covered a sole proprietorship, and now we've covered all of our partnerships. So we're ready for LLC, or Limited Liability Company. This is a new type of entity, different from sole proprietorships and different from partnerships. So let's see what's going on with this one. Okay, so here's our definition. A limited liability company is an unincorporated business. Let's pause here and think about this. What does unincorporated mean? In this context, it means not a corporation.
So what we're saying is a limited liability company isn't a type of corporation. It's something different than a corporation. We haven't talked about a corporation yet, so it's a little bit, you know, getting the, the cart before the horse, so to speak, but we'll get to that in just a second. So a limited liability company is something other than a corporation. It is taxed like a partnership. Okay, so we get that tax through tax, excuse me, um, pass through taxation that we've talked about before with the members paying personal income taxes and it has the limited liability of a corporation. Okay, which is of course the same type of, of liability that we've seen with the LLPs. So an LLC is tax just like an LLP and there's the limitations on liability that we've seen with an LLP. So it's pretty similar to an LLP. Um, the, the main differences, I would say there are two main differences. One is kind of almost, I'll call it a cultural difference. Um, we're not using the term partner here. We use, we're, we're not talking about partnership, we're talking about a company. Um, the term partner, especially in professions, especially in the law, is a very um, time-honored, a very um, culture-bound, a very kind of, I don't want to overstate it, but almost an emotional word that people in this industry uh, use. There's a lot of feelings of continuity, feelings of professionalism that are part of that identity with partnerships. And so um, that's just an important part of the way many people feel about the word partnerships. Um, and that can be one of the reasons why businesses, when they are choosing between LLCs and LLPs, that they pick LLP just for those kind of warm and fuzzy feelings they have about the idea of partnerships. The idea of a partnership is about collegiality, about um, helping one another out, about going the extra mile uh, for that other person in the entity. And it's not that people in an LLC aren't equally kind and lovely and awesome people, but there aren't all of those traditions of uh, fiduciary duty and all those things that we have with the partnership. So that's one difference between an LLC and an LLP. The other difference is perhaps a little bit more practical, and that is um, that um, an LLC um, will uh, can exist when there is only a single member. Let me first of all talk about what a member is. A member is the word that we use for owners of an LLC. When we're talking about a sole proprietorship, we call the owner the sole proprietor. When we talked about a partnership, we call the owners partners. When we talk about an LLC, the name for owners is members. There can be a single member or there can be multiple members. This is our first type of entity in which that is a true statement. A sole proprietor can have, a, have only one owner. A partnership has to have more than one owner. So this is the first one that allows you to have a single owner or multiple owners. And again, the name for owners is members. Another aspect of an LLC that's interesting is that we, we divide them up into two categories, member managed or manager managed. My guess is that member managed is quite a bit more common. I don't have the statistics for it, but let's just look at what the two mean. And again, it's pretty intuitive. In an LLC, the owners can manage the business themselves. They're the ones running the cash register, setting policy, developing marketing plans. There may be employees too doing that stuff as well, but usually an LLC isn't so big that the owners aren't out there making decisions, running things. But it is possible to have an LLC that the um, members, the owners are hands off, that they are more investors than anything else, and that they hire actual managers to run the business. In this case, the managers are employees of the LLC. Now that uh, requires probably a, a bigger LLC than a member managed LLC, but it can be either way. Whichever way you want to establish it, that's how you would complete your certificate of formation. Remember that Secretary of State website, you actually have to specify it on the form. Okay, so when you have a single member LLC, it's kind of like a sole proprietorship, and you can see how. You know, before when you're talking about sole proprietorships, you might have been thinking to yourself, well, Groover, 
we, we can't become a partnership because there's only one of us and we don't really want to bring anybody else in. So how do we stop being a sole proprietorship? How do we may, take away that problem that we have about no limitations on personal liability? Well, most likely a sole proprietor is going to transition to a limited liability company as his second entity uh, once he gets, gets his bearings and figures out what he wants to do. If he's just a sole uh, member LLC, he probably doesn't need an operating agreement because he would just be agreeing with himself. That's kind of silly. I mean, you can't, oh, I think, you know, I think I'd take 100% of the profits. Well, no, I don't think you should take 100% of the profits. Well, I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. Um, but once you have more than one member, then just like you want to have those articles of partnership, you're going to want to have an operating agreement, which is the name that we have for an LLC, that it performs that same function. It allows the parties, when everybody likes each other, everybody, to anticipate all the different decisions that need to be made. And it, it not only records it so there can't be questions of people's poor memory, but it also um, allows or helps the members to anticipate questions that might come up. Just like we talked about with the limited partnership and the limited liability partnership, we need that signal. And this is the, the signal that we need. Of course, it can and almost always will be abbreviated to LLC. Um, LLCs are very, very popular. Um, I don't give legal advice to students, but I will tell you that if you are starting your own business, um, very, very likely this is going to be a good choice for you. Um, and so uh, think about it. Um, definitely consider this as an option as you um, start your business. Even if you think you can start out for the first little while as a sole proprietorship, um, if your business um, has any legs really at all, you're going to want to transition to something else. And the LLC is, is likely to be something that is worthy of your serious consideration. So now we've talked about sole proprietorships, general partnership, limited partnership, limited liability partnerships, and limited liability companies. We have one more entity to talk about, and that is corporations. I'm going to end this presentation this time, and we'll cover this, the corporations as well as uh, uh, several other issues in our next presentation. Thanks for your attention. Like, as always, if you have questions about this material, please feel free to email me, stop by my office hours, or raise them in class. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great day.